I was invited to speak about uh, why we need to support LNET. And uh, one of the things that came to my mind was uh, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, although I grew up in the St. Andrews PCA, I used to sometimes go to NPC, Nairobi Pentecostal, which is now CITAM, for their Tuesday prayer meetings. And sometimes they'd have extended meetings and I'd attend those ones. And there was a gentleman who used to come there called Barry Smith, and who would speak about the end times and the new world order. So many of the prophecies he shared those days have actually begun to pass in our day. He spoke about the world aligning so as to prepare us for one world leader. He spoke of a day in the future when we'd have chips in our bodies, uh, which we'd use either on, we'd have on our head or on our forehead or in our hands, and that would be a way of uh, our information being transmitted to others. And it was at that time he was saying it was being tested in animals. So those people who had very special pets would ensure they get those chips so that in case it gets lost, if you are able to be able to trace it and find where it is. And as we know today, there are a number of companies where people log in with chips. So you don't need to go and say, do anything else, you just come, put your hand there and the doors open. You do put your hand there and your computer opens up. Everything is through a chip. And then he said at that time, watch as cash is faced out and a cashless society ushered in, the ultimate tool to control and manipulate people. This would include the mark of the beast system of buying and selling, so a microchip implanted in the body or in the, fore, in the hand or in the forehead. And as you see, even here in Kenya, we're heading to a cashless society. And we actually love it. We have the M-Pesa. Every time, now when COVID came, it was so easy to use M-Pesa. <laughs> Lucky us, <laughs> we didn't have to use the money. We already had, we were already beginning that process and people are beginning to copy us because they like how M-Pesa works. Of course, we use a lot more of cards, uh, credit cards and debit cards. We prefer them for making payments. So, and we already have some countries in the world that have become cashless. I think a place like Sweden, they are not using that much cash. So really, a lot of the things that he spoke, we can already begin to see them today. And uh, when he also, so when, as you think about what Barry Smith said, Matthew 24, 12 to 14 says, and I read from the Amplified Version, Matthew 24, 12 to 14, because lawlessness is increased, the love of most people will grow cold. But the one who endures and bears up under suffering to the end will be saved. This good news of the kingdom, the gospel, will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end of the age will come. So I'm sure from what we've been seeing, many of us can testify we are heading to the last days. We are really, the world is coming to an end. But one prerequisite before the end comes is the gospel must be preached to all the nations. And we sing the song, these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. These are the days of great trials, and we've seen them, of famine and darkness and sword. Still, we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are all white in our world. And we are the laborers that are in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. The question then, are we who are called to be laborers out in the vineyard? Think about that. Are we? In Nehemiah 13, 10 to 12, and I'll quote again from Amplified, here he's talking about states, but the scenario is almost the same. And Nehemiah said, I also discovered that the portions due to the Levites had not been given to them, so the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone away, each one back to his own field. Then I reprimanded the officials and said, why is the house of God neglected? So I gathered the Levites and singers together and restored them at their posts. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the storehouses. So although he's talking here about tithes, actually the same is also true of the support to ministry. If Elnet does not get funds, then the office will close because the team must put food on the table for their families. They must have roofs over their head and even means to come to the office. So before we even consider the means to go and work in the vineyard, these other, other needs must also be met. Otherwise, then we'll expect them to go out there back to wherever they are and look for these things, we'll find them maybe on the streets talking or doing other things, whatever it is, go looking for jobs elsewhere because 
they must do some of these things. So just as it was in the time of Nehemiah, we can easily find ourselves here because they need to look for their means of sustenance. And during the end time messages, Barrett Smith also spoke about kingdom financials. He said God is going to raise people who will finance the spread of the gospel so that it goes to all the world and then the end will come. And I remember when I heard that message, I said, Lord, I would want to be one of those kingdom financiers. In Luke 8, 1 to 3, amplified again, uh, we are told about soon afterward, Jesus began going around from one city and village to another, preaching and proclaiming the goodness of the kingdom of God. The 12 disciples were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, and Joanne, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household stu- steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means, as was a custom for a rabbi's disciples. So these women had benefited from the gospel and had received their healing. So in appreciation, they began to give towards the preaching of the gospel, and they did this not out of abundance, but out of whatever they had. They knew that this gospel that they had benefited from can also benefit others. Therefore, they ensured that the gospel spread in the land through their giving. Their attitude was an exceptional one, and God wants us to emulate this and be kingdom financiers. As a Christian who has received salvation and the blessing that it brings, you have a responsibility to spread the gospel using your resources like these women did. Jesus Christ came to pay the price so that we can be saved, so that others can also be saved. And the only way others can be saved is if we spread the gospel by every means possible. We are living in a world where money facilitates things. That's the reality. When money is available, things happen fast and the gospel moves quickly. This was demonstrated during the COVID season. The churches that had invested in media were able to reach not only their own members, but people across the world. Those that had not invested in media our media equipment struggled to even reach their own, a few of their own members. So from this we learn the bigger the investment, the bigger and further the impact will be. The smaller the investment, the smaller the impact and the effect of whatever it is we are doing. So as a kingdom financier, your goal will always be to make funds available to aid the spreading of the gospel. You don't have to wait until you have plenty you can contribute. Just give whatever you have. Start from where you are and what you have. Your faithfulness and your determination are all God is watching out for. So I encourage each of us to begin today to give towards kingdom advancement because the Bible tells us God loves a cheerful giver. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compassion. For God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one whose heart is in his gift. So giving with your whole heart in it, that's the amplified version. So let me share briefly my journey with Elnet. Elnet was started by Dr. Mwangi, or Kiruhi as he now calls himself. I don't know that transition. <laughs> so I never get used to that name. I always wonder who they are talking about. But the team kind of like helps you to connect. So, as, so he, had trans, he was transitioning from being the national director of Life Ministry or Campus Crusade somewhere between 2005-2008. So I'd met Tim at PCA St. Andrews when he joined the university. I imagine he probably came, I, I, I imagine that's when he came to Nairobi <laughs> and people come and they locate their PCA church that they, <laughs> they were in PCA there so they come and they locate their local, their, their local church in the area they've come. So that's when I met him, I was a youth leader then. So he came and he joined the youth. Then on graduation from university, he chose to go to life ministry. And for those that know life ministry, staff have to raise their own support. So obviously he started from home. And I was one of the people he spoke to. What he didn't know is his monthly budget was more than my salary. What had happened is I lost my dad uh, abruptly. It was a car accident. And one of my cousins said, I think you should get a job. So I got this job, you know. I was, I was in the middle of college, so I got this job. <laughs> I, st- I was studying and working. So now he is looking for the people who are working and uh, says, this is my budget. Uh, can you support? <laughs> Look at this budget. It is about double my salary. Eh? <laughs> I never said anything then. I, uh, yeah, so 
<laughs> and I agreed to support him. Yeah, I would partner with him. I gave him a certain amount of money, and I continued to support him for all the years that I was working. And even more, I got to know more of his colleagues, and I also got to support them. Until the time I was, I stopped working. That's the time I told him, "Now I'm not working. I cannot be able to continue this." So I was out of the country when Enlet started. However, when I got back, Tim looped me in, and I plugged into the mentoring arm, and served in the board also briefly. So to facilitate mentoring, we wrote a manual, and you've just heard about it. So it means funds were required to print that manual. Eh? And then later we did the Nimiyamoa Kua Ethical. And again, even that whole program, the manual, again required funds. So in the absence of funds, we would not be talking about these manuals we are talking about because somebody had to make that cost and meet that cost and so that this thing could be used as a tool. It's a tool that's being used in many places. We even went to a place like... Uh, um, the Sunshine High School used to mentor those students. We've had a lot of trainings in the mentoring place and all that. We trained the mentors who are going to do Nimeamua Kua Ethical. We needed that tool to enable us to do it. So for us to be able to function like that, money was required to facilitate. The Life Ministry staff I supported not only worked in different parts of Kenya, but some of them went out to Zimbabwe, to Jamaica, to Mozambique, and people got saved there. So guess what? Those people who got saved there, even me, I'm accounted for as having been part of that. So yeah. since I gave to that, yes. Yeah, so one day I will walk into heaven and people from Zimbabwe, I have never been to Zimbabwe, I've never been to Jamaica, <laughs> I've never been to Mozambique, and they'll come to me and say, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am here because you give. So I'll be told, these people got saved because of you. Did I speak to them? No. But I facilitated what it is that these guys were doing, and because of that, I will be given credit for that, for supporting the missionaries who went out there. So I support other ministries, and I'm convinced that many of the blessings coming my way are because of people <coughs> I don't know who are praying for me. Yeah. Even things like you go run for the Bible, or you help BTL, mm -hmm. and you whatever. People get a new Bible in a language they've never read. Like I was in Sambur when they got the New Testament last year. I'm sure when they opened that Bible every morning or whatever time, they thank God for the people who facilitated. And I matter I gave five shillings or a hundred shillings, I gave, contributed to it. So I'm part of the people who made that Bible possible. So when they pray and they thank God for me, blessings are hitting me and I have no idea. It's not like I woke up and spent hours praying. <laughs> but things happen my way and I'm like, what is this? It is those guys out there who I do not know many of them who are praying for somebody they don't know, but they are saying, Lord, for those people who you have been able to do this, Please remember them and do something for them. So I thank God for that. And we need to tap those blessings on this end of the earth because they are surely there. And the good thing about it is that they'll go to our children and our children's children. So some of those people, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, will benefit not knowing why they're being blessed, but it's because of whatever it is we've done now is having an impact long term. So the kingdom of heaven is like treasures hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. That's in Matthew 13, 44. And there's a gentleman called Randy Alcon. He's an author, and he calls this the treasure principle. And he has six things that he points out in the six treasure principles, and he says, and this will help you to experience the liberating act of giving. The first one he says is, God owns everything. I am his money manager. Literally, that's who you are. God owns everything. You're just his money manager. So we are the managers of the assets God has entrusted, not given to us. They're just entrusted to you, but they are not given to you. And just think about it. Five minutes after you die, will it matter how much money you have in the bank or the things that you own here on earth? Zero. Yes, so don't die and leave money in your accounts. You spend that money and spend it now. It's better, yes, and don't leave it for other people. Eh? In fact, I tell people generally, by the way, do not deny yourself going out for the holidays and doing all those things and come to spend that money. Don't say you're leaving it for the Those people you're living for will do all the things you never did. So, and most times it's in the entertainment side. It's true. The part is some of us don't go for holidays, don't do anything because we are saving this money. I don't know for what. We want to die with a bigger bank account. We die with a zero a bank account. Spend your money, go out on your holidays, give to the ministries, do whatever it is, invest in the kingdom to come. So then the second principle says, my heart always goes out where, goes where I put God's money. So what, what happens when you reallocate your money from temporal things to internal things? I talk a lot about investments, 
And I can tell you a lot of things about you can invest in the temporal. And we know that the treasury bonds, treasury bills, shares, real estate, they're very good things. But there's that, and then there's also the eternal investment. And this is really what we're talking about today, the eternal investment. So when you invest in the kingdom, you will be interested to know what is going happening in the ministry. So the updates and the newsletters will be very important. What are you doing? We are put, we're investing here because whatever money we give here is an investment. We could either put it out there in the treasury bonds or we could put it here in Elnet. And when it's coming to Elnet, we're expecting there is work that is happening. Montreal, the results. We went out, we did this, this was the impact. We contributed to the constitution. We went to EACC. We challenge them business people, we are mentoring the new people who are coming. That information is very key. So it becomes important because as you hear that, then you're able to, just like when you hear share prices are going up, or you say, okay, let me add some more money because I can actually see where this thing, the impact of what is happening. So wherever you put your money, for sure, you will follow your heart because this is that money you're giving out of yourself. You will follow what is happening with that money. Then heaven, not earth, is my home. We are citizens of a better country, a heavenly one, and I think we know that. Then I should not live for the dot, but for the line. So if we were to draw a straight line to represent all of our life, the, a dot represents our life on earth. And many of us live for the dot, forgetting about the bigger line. So we need to live for the whole line and not just for dot. So think eternity, not just this small life we are living here. 100 years, 120 if you're lucky, but usually we are just told 70 mm -hmm. and 80 if you're, <laughs> yes. And then giving is the only antidote to materialism. That's the fifth principle. Giving is a joyful surrender to a greater person and a greater agenda. It dethrones me and it exalts God. And you know, Alcon says, this Randy Alcon, he says, many people can't afford to give precisely because they don't want to give. So when people tell me they can't afford to tithe, he asks them, would you die if your income was reduced by 10%? And they say no. And then he says, then you have admitted that you can afford to tithe, it's just that you don't want to. <laughs> so giving is worship to God. <laughs> and when it's done sacrificially, it's a choice to give to the kingdom, to praise God by honoring his commandments, to share with others and care for the least of these people. So when we give, it is an act of worship. And then the sixth principle is God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. Not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. It's tempting, of course, the more money we have, the more we want to buy a bigger car, a bigger many things. So God gives more money than we need so we can give generously. And uh, somebody has said, it was Peter Marshall who said, give according to your income, lest God make your income according to your giving. So that should be a very motivating factor. <laughs> and I like to remind give according to your income. Let's God make your income according to your giving. So if you're wanting to withhold more, then uh, if this is how much you can give, then maybe you don't need as much money as you're being given. So give according to what you have. So otherwise, then, if you don't need to give that much, why do you need to be receiving that much? And this guy, uh, Randy Alcon, has paraphrased the words of Ecclesiastes 5, 10 to 15 in regards to money and happiness. And he says, whoever loves money never has enough. And the truth is, the more you have, the more you want. And we see that every day in the papers. People with billions still want to steal more billions. And it's like, how will you even consume what you already have? You can't, but the more you have, the more you will want. So money in itself, it will never be enough. Then whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. The more you have, the less you are satisfied. That's the amazing thing, that the more you think when you actually think of a life that the time you thought, like, if I could get this, if I could get this, you think it will make you necessarily more happier? No, because if it did, all these people are getting these big amounts of money would be very happy. But they're not. They're sleepless, trying to figure out how they can make more money and all that. They, they are not happy with what they have. Then, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. The more you have, the more people, including the government, come after you. KRA will be very happy to chase after you because you can pay them even more taxes. So, and the more money you have, the more people there. Are. Now, there'll be additional people who want to be partakers of whatever it is that you're making. And then what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The more you have, the more you realize it doesn't meet your real needs. And I think one of the best things about COVID is we discovered with all our big machines, we were under lockdown. So, here are your five cars parked there. 
Yeah, the more you have, the more you have to look at, there was nothing you could do with it. You didn't need it. COVID made us realize how very basic our needs were. Then the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. So the more you have, the more you have to worry about. And actually, I always think about that guy, say in Kibera, who only owns a bicycle. At night, he packs his bicycle next to his bed and falls asleep. His sleep is sweet. You with your cars out there, a small sound. Who has come for my car? Who's come for my house? <laughs> yeah, you don't sleep with all the things that you have. But this guy, the bicycle, sleep. I mean, who's coming there for the bike? They don't even know there's a bicycle in the house. Then I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner. The more you have, the more you can hurt yourself by holding on to it. I think it speaks for itself. Or wealth lost through some misfortune. The more you have, the more you have to lose. When the uh, uh, economy came down, we were seeing people in uh, Nairobi Securities Exchange losing millions. I mean, it's paper millions, but yes, they were, you, if you didn't have any, whatever, you, that was news and information. They've lost 10 million. What did, how did it impact you? You don't have that kind of money, so there's no 10 million you're losing. Maybe you lost like 500 or 1,000. That's a small amount. The more you have, the more you have to lose. So, naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. The more you have, the more you have to leave behind. So please, as I said earlier, don't leave too much behind. Try and consume it as much as possible in advance. <laughs> and one of the ways of spending it is giving it to where it can actually do work that is going to carry on beyond you and beyond your own legacy. So there's a story of Alexander the Great, and probably you've heard about his death wishes on his deathbed. Uh, Alexander summoned his army generals and told them his three ultimate wishes. The first one, he said only the best doctors who treated his sickness should carry his coffin to the graveyard. Second, the wealth he has accumulated, money, gold, silver, should be scattered along his coffin procession to the, to the cemetery. So as you're carrying him, you go scattering his money and whatever he has gathered on the way. And the third, he said his hand should be let loose or they hang outside the coffin for all to see. So one of his generals was very surprised by this unusual request. So he asked Alexander to explain. And this is what Alexander the Great had to say. I want best doctors to carry my coffin to demonstrate that in the face of death, even the best doctors in the world have no power to heal. Secondly, I want the road to be covered with my treasure so that everybody sees that material wealth acquired on earth will stay on earth. And thirdly, I want my hands to swing in the wind so people understand that we come to this world empty, we come to this world empty-handed, and we leave this world empty-handed after the most precious treasure of all is exhausted, and that is time. So by hanging his hand out, you see, he is carrying nothing, never mind how rich he was. And it's true, of course, even for all of us. We will go with zero from here. So we have a limited time to preach. We are being told the most important treasure is time. We have a limited time to preach the gospel, and we, we need to maximize on it. So in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, using the message version, it says, don't hold treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust, or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you most want to be and end up being. So in your own time, I encourage you to look up the story of a gentleman called Henry Parsons Crowell. He was a founder of Quaker. Henry Parsons Crowell. He was a founder of Quaker Oaks, Oats Company, the Oats, Oatmeal, Quaker Oats Company. And this man was faithful and successful, and he invested his life and his wealth for the spread of the gospel and gave away nearly 70% of his income for more than 40 years. So I'm sure even in this room, there are people who have eaten Quaker Oats. I ate Quaker Oats, and I'm sure there's other people who have eaten Quaker Oats. That guy from that time, that in, he was doing business, but he realized how much, even as a business person, it was important to invest in the kingdom. And the Lord blessed him in a fantastic way. So as I come to a conclusion, which I'll have finally, and before I come to sit down, to be many levels of conclusion. So, <laughs> yeah, I, told, I, I am paid to talk, so I like talking. So as I come to, as I conclude, 
do not wait to have plenty before you can contribute. Whatever you have, start with the little you have. Second Corinthians 9, 10 says, Now he who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed for sowing, that is, your resources, and increase the harvest of your righteousness, which shows itself in active goodness, kindness, and love. So if your appetite for present things, and I'm quoting somebody called Thomas Akempis, if your appetite for present things is excessive, you may lose eternal and heavenly ones. Use the things of the world, but long for the things of eternity. You cannot be fully satisfied by material possessions, for you are simply not made to enjoy them. Even if you owned every good thing in the world, you would not be happy and blessed, for your blessedness and joy is in God who created all those things. That's Thomas Akempis. Then, I pray that for each one of us, the words of Rebold song, thank you for giving to the Lord, will be something that each one of us will experience and says, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad that you gave. I pray there will be people you will meet on the other side who will be saying thank you for giving to the Lord. And so I invite you. I want to end with a quote by Randy Alcon in the Treasure Principle and says, I invite you to transfer your assets from earth to heaven. I invite you to give humbly, generously, and frequently to God's work. Excel in giving so that you may please God, serve others, and enjoy treasures in heaven. Praise be to God. Amen, amen and amen.